Death seemed like a friend to him, and he wasn't afraid of death. He was a, just such an extremist, you know, he would have it all or nothing. He always knew that he would kill himself from like the age of seven. Donald Camel, the British director of a handful of visionary, stylish, and often bizarre films, died of a self-inflicted gunshot to the head in Los Angeles on April the 24th. Camel was 62. He burst upon the film scene with his first effort, Performance, 1970. Mick Jagger starred as a rock star who decides to switch identities with a hunted hitman. Critics praised the film for its chilling, nightmarish portrait of the dark side. Camel made only three other films. That's from The Hollywood Reporter. He was a one-man performance. I mean, he was a great performer himself. You name one beautiful woman of the 60s, and she knows the night, intimately or not. I think he was an outsider from the beginning. He had a strange social and sexual scene. Perhaps he had a tendency towards being a pagan. Paul and Brando and I we saw Donald as an original, one of few. Not the most difficult director, but the most determined. And I had already done Raging Bull and all that stuff. There were many times where Donald attended meetings with a gun at his side. In some ways, he was his own worst enemy. Donald was only difficult because of his own vision of what should be put on the screen. started at Chelsea Art School and it was my first week there and I was standing in a bus stop in the rain and um, this, uh, this beautiful young man walked by and started chatting me up as they would say in England. That's how I first met Donald. He had a studio on Flood Street and he was a painter and uh, I thought that was just completely fabulous because it's what I wanted to be. And uh, he had the lifestyle of a painter down pat. Uh, very glamorous and cool, I thought, very sort of bohemian. He had these little demonic teeth, these little fangs, which of course he had all his life. And you half expected him to have a little tail. Cause, and uh, he, was a, he was like a pan creature. Donald showed a prodigious talent at a very early age as an artist. And that delighted my father. By the time he was 19, he was earning a very good living as a professional painter. I went to a farmer's house in the country once and I saw the picture of the guy whose house it was. And I looked at the bottom and it said, Donald Camel, 1950-something, or I don't know when, it was very early. I said, can't be. And I asked around and it was, and it was very precocious talent, wasn't it? He had a tremendous melancholy, even then. This dynamic, which was both dark and distraught and, and very magnetic and seductive. He'd been brought up and encouraged by my father to be a, a classical painter, but he wasn't comfortable with that. He did find himself being steered towards becoming a fashionable portrait painter, and I think he didn't relish that particular future for himself.
He was obviously looking for a more contemporary style of painting, and he decided to go to Paris. I met him in the early 60s. I'd just come from New York and I went straight to Paris. I got an agent in New York for modeling and I was in Paris and I was modeling in Paris. And uh, I think I met his girlfriend first, Deborah, on the job or something like that, or in the club. We used to go to Castells a lot and dance. Donald and Deborah, of course, to me, uh, uh, were a team. You know, it wasn't just Donald, it was uh, Donald and Deborah. You know, they both together made quite a powerful impact on a number of people in Paris. Because Deborah was making pots of money in those days. Uh, she was a top model. She befriended girls in, in unusual ways, you know. We did go on holidays together as well, and that was great fun. Like, we used to go, like, on Saturday night after clubbing, drive down to Saint Tropez and go out crazy stuff like that. Everybody else was, like, twisting away. We kind of had already our little, own little style, which is, like, more international, I would say, and it was, like, more just little steps, like James Brown style. Yeah, I used to visit him. And Donald was a fascinating guy. He was a great talker. He was very erudite, very educated. He was very interested in the mysteries of life, hinging on the kind of spiritual. He was very, very sensual, yet he had a kind of ascetic quality. So it was a real mixture. He purposely threw his spell onto sort of women and innocent some and not so innocent others, but it didn't seem to matter. His attitude was really the attitude that became the attitude of the 60s. You know, sex is one of the enjoyable and pleasurable things you can, uh, you should study. <laughs> he wanted to partake with every woman, but the way he was doing it was, he had something that men could not understand. Women did not resist. Women were willing. Threesome was one of his main obsessions. Young girl was definitely the number one obsession. I could get you into dodgy situations, especially on the sex angle. So on that level, he was dangerous, but uh, on that day, he was very kind of, uh, he used loads of fantasy, loads of imagination. Then I met Brian of the Stones. I met him in Paris, actually, and they had a gig. And then afterwards, we took Brian over to Donald's, and um, so Donald was very fascinated by the whole pop scene. And he thought those people were all very sexy and erotic, really. You know, these young kind of boys with loads of money. Brian and I became friends instantly. You, you know about Brian, you know. I had a great admiration for him and his work and his, his whole strange um, thing because he was, he was, he was a, someone who really saw his whole life in, po in a poetic way, you know. It was an artifact. that he had a driving conviction or passion to be a painter. His father wanted him to be a painter, you know. When he moved to Paris, he kind of dropped his painterly life. He felt that painting had basically died with the Impressionists, even though he was an ardent admirer of Picasso and Bacon. And... But he felt that, like, God is dead, you know. Painting was over. It had now, it film was a new medium. He destroyed all the paintings in his studio and he decided to move back to London. London was at absolutely the height of swinging 60s at that point. He could see this strange mixture of aristocrats and gangsters, and politicians, creative people, destructive people, all in a kind of exciting melange.
and that's what inspired him to write his first script. Basically, it was a caper movie, but unfortunately it was bought by Hollywood and they subsequently transformed it into an absolute parody of the swinging 60s. It's gonna be a groovy little happening, man. I thought it might be a, not an art film, but more of a genre film, the, the correct genre. It ended up as this hodgepodge, uh, which was sort of part studio, part Hollywood, part sort of British rank. I mean, it was really quite pathetic. Well, this whole thing is totally absurd, man. Precisely. Well, you create beautiful absurdities, why can't I? I want to create a fantastic amateur theatrical, a happening, to sort of shoot an absurd movie without a camera. I was fired as the writer, then I was rehired just when the movie was about to begin to do a final draft script by a new director, oh, it's typical Hollywood stuff. And I was a veteran then. And I met Jimmy Fox and I was very impressed by his work. He was around for all the shooting, he was very passionate about the shooting, and he came down to Almeria, he brought Deborah down to Almeria, and he and I were tremendous friends by that time. We used to uh, bemoan the terrible way the film was going and some of the things that were being done to the film that were being ruined and Donald was tearing his hair out. But we forged a, a friendship at that time because I think he perhaps felt I was a kindred spirit. You're not a psychopath. Oh, I'm not. No, somewhere inside you is a, an unborn psychedelic Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> You're a showman, baby. England, which was so tidy and polite, and suddenly there was this breakthrough of this incredible sexual energy in them. It was extraordinary. It seemed to happen overnight, that everybody was just screwing everybody else in 20 seconds, you know, and it was just, it was as if uh, 50 years were compressed into two. Huh? God, I remember when he would come back from seeing a concert of Mick Jagger's and he would be just absolutely yeah, stunned and innamorato, you know, just... He was himself a one-man performance. He was a great performer. And he loved performances. He loved Mick Jagger's power over an audience. He clearly was fascinated by the power of the, the gangster world. I remember you in Hemlock Road in 1956. You're a baggy little leather boy with a smaller piece of stick. Well, you're a lashing, smashing hunk of man. Your sweat shines sweet and strong. Your organ's working perfectly, but there's a part that's not screwed on. My next movie was about a, a, a gangster getting stranded in England at London Airport, an American gangster, and uh, meeting a, a musician in a, a sort of a fast food joint. And, and that relationship developed into the plot that was essentially the same plot as performance. Like a lot of movies, I mean, it changed a lot from the original um, sitting around the kitchen version that it was, and then into the first script. And that, by the time we came to do it, I was, you know, I knew it. I felt I knew it almost as much as Donald knew it because it 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 had become sort of a part of your life, you know. Well, it was altogether more promising because whereas Duffy, he had, had no control over it, this time he said, I'm going to direct. Um, and uh, this time we're going to do it the way it should be done. I was an agent uh, before I produced performance. Uh, I was Donald's agent, for that matter, and as well as Mick Jagger's. So uh, the company that I worked with actually made the deal for me with Warner Brothers. They were representing Warner Brothers as well as me. 
The finance was no problem at all. They were excited about a film with Mick Jagger. A film, and then we'll have a soundtrack, most we'll songs, and you know, which they didn't get finally. <laughs> but, um, and it was the deal that started. They didn't even realize that they hadn't got a script. I mean, Sandy was very good. Donald and I had talked about the film and the fact that we wanted Donald to direct it. And at some point, um, it was Donald's suggestion that Nick Rogue become involved. And I approached him, of course, as to be the cameraman. He said that he didn't want to do any more pictures as a cameraman. He was now a director. And I had no qualms at all about saying, well, so what? Well, it's directed together. <laughs> We were left alert, you know, suddenly we were in this void. And with a freedom that nobody was look, checking up on. Well, that's a... I mean, how often could that happen? You know, now, now you have 18 people on the set, you know, questioning whether someone raises their fork or not. We spend all our time together, evenings, lunch hours and so on, talking about how we were going to do a scene, how we'd do a setup, how we'd do a shot. Um, I rehearsed all the actors, and Nick used to come in and watch the rehearsals. He'd come in, you see, blue blazer. He always had to wear a blue blazer. It was one of the rules of the set, that Nick had to wear the blue blazer and the tie, and I had the, all the gear, you know. Getting on the set, I would pass the ball completely to Nick with the camera crew, because there he was in his element. I would then block the actors, and he would block the camera. And it worked great. We actually worked on the set so swiftly that people would say, well, the two director scene is the wave of the future. Hold up, pal. You do yourself a mischief. <laughs> This takes me back. Your old man was a barber, wasn't he, Rosie? No. No, he wasn't. Shut your old moody. I didn't realize how the personality and the view of the world of British gangsters would begin to affect me. Hair today and gone tomorrow. I said shut your bloody hole! And as England now took over, as, a, as at that time, the, the scene in, in the world, culturally, of avant-garde culture and music, they had to have a gangster world, an underworld. It's a necessary ingredient in any society. And they had it. it the craze happened to be there, and the Richardsons, you know, and a few others. So uh, they were sort of ready-made. They were, they were really British. They were really wicked. They, they were suitably glamorous. The one problem was the characterization of James Fox as a, uh, a Londoner from the East End. Because he was perceived as a very sort of snooty, upper-class, sort of the young guardsman type. In my imagination, I thought, yeah, I can project myself into this Jack the Lad. They told me about these guys who, uh, who were often very, very good-looking, very athletic, um, very cold um, performers who would go and put the frighteners on people. And there were quite famous ones around. A lot of it was modelled on a man called Jimmy Evans. He killed a number of people and was known as a, a man who enjoyed the mayhem. He was a highly adrenalised character, very good looking. He walked like that, he talked like that. He was a real East End hood. And I was a bit frightened of him. I disapproved of some of the things he told me very strongly. And I would get all huffy about it and say, listen, this is going, up. I think it's going too far, Jimmy, you know. And he would have a good laugh about this. Who do you think you are? The Lone Ranger? I know who I am, Harry. Of course you do, son. You're Jack the Lad. I've known a few performers in my time. But I tell you this, he's got the gift boy. Right, Danny? He enjoys his work. Oh, I do. I get a load of kicks out of it. But it can also be a tricky thing. And I'll tell you why. Because you can get to enjoy your work too much, my son. And it can slip your mind that you're bloody working for me, you buck! Well, I first got involved by, um, through a guy called Tommy Gibbons. He was a pal of mine that had the pub in El Camp Road called the Thomas a Beckett. And he rang me one day and said that he'd had a couple of guys from a movie that wanted someone to uh, 
meet an actor, take him around South London, meet the characters, take him around the pubs and clubs. And he said that he'd put my name in. And it turned out that the actor was James Fox. Hello, James. There he was, he turned up with this sort of flowery scarf, big hat, <laughs> and completely differently dressed to the people in South London. And that's, that was our first meeting, right? What did they think down the back here? Oh, well, after a Poof while... They, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, after a while they loved it, didn't they? He had a blinding left hand. I know that there were gangsters, or suppose... I don't know gangsters, you know. I know the chaps, you know, and characters. But uh, you're very... Oh, that seems like an Americanism, doesn't it? Gangsters. Well, you see, all the people that we met, or the people that I knew and the people that Jimmy met, well, not that, although they might be thought of as, you know, sort of uh, the chaps, they're all very nice people. They don't do any wrong to their own. And Jimmy Fox was regarded as one of their own. Game boy, HS. And a blinding left hand. Bastard! He did a lot of exercises because he wanted to get himself fit and well for the job, you know, for the movie. There was a time when he boxed one of the guys up in the gym, so he's got his got seven bells out of his poor side. You know, the guy's nose ears has gone bump, bump, <laughs> bump, and the blood was coming out. He loved it. He loved, I'm probably sure he loved it. And then one day he said to me, you know what, Johnny? He said, I think there's a part in this film that you could play. Harry Flowers was supposedly a bit, uh, puffy, wasn't he? I suppose I based it on a lot of different people, not any one particular person, although it was said at the time that they thought that the, the uh, Cray twins Ronnie and Reggie. Yeah, well, the less I say about that, even though I'm a long way away, and they're a long way away, and all the rest, the better. There, there, was, a, there was that homosexual panache and an ambiance on that real working level. The, the boys were sexual objects. And that's the way that it was. That's the, maybe I exaggerated it. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Donald asked me to do strange things, which I would not do. I mean, suddenly, you know, after a few days filming, he suddenly came up with this idea that he wanted me to appear in the nude. Well, I told him I'm not having that. I found out that Donald had had, and Nick, I suppose, had had this idea of having Harry Flowers' gang all in the nude. So I said, no, no, I shan't have none of that. I don't want none of that. And he said to me, well, what would happen if Fellini asked you to appear in the nude? Well, I said, look, I'm sorry, Donald, but you're not Fellini. And so in my contract, was a clause, it was put in, saying that I am not to display my genitals in front of the technicians. I thought that satisfied it. I mean, John Bindon, he, he was all for it, he didn't mind one little bit. Stanley Meadows didn't want to do it. And Tony Morton was adamant, I'm not going to do it, no way, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Suddenly, Donald took him to lunch, had a couple of bottles of wine, and he'd come back, and he was suggesting better ways to do it. <laughs> I didn't mean it in any way to be mocking. I mean, it was a mark of respect for the gay world that they had, in a sense, had so much influence and control in the underworld. And my access to that world was through Freud, Bacon, and so on. And that was in a world of great, great artists, a number of whom happened to be gay. And the overlap between the underworld and the artistic world was what I was showing in performance. There's an image of four or five naked men lying around in the, what was the office. It was intended to be a sort of Bacon-esque and an homage. It's very easy to say an homage. Anytime you copy someone, you say it's an homage to them. So I copied some of them, not, maybe not literally, but I copied it in my heart. Those were probably the images that I felt strongest about in the movie. They had an outrageous quality that I wanted to have, that appealed to me, the naked men, you know. I don't think any other English film has ever dealt with that subculture like that. We're so obsessed with class in this country, but not with subculture. And subculture is much more interesting. Paris Square, not Hill Gate. The film itself, the first half is what I understood. I didn't understand the second half. You know, all the drugs bit and the, the sex bit. I didn't even know about all that gangster stuff, you know. When I first saw it, the film, that's the only time I, I first even heard about it. Well, really, performance is a film of two halves. The first tells the story of Chaz, who's on the run from his own gang. 
and he holds up in the house of Turner, who's a washed-up pop star. As the film progresses, we see the merging of the two aspects of performance, the artistic performance on the one hand, the violent performer on the other. Why don't you go to a hotel? A hotel? You must be joking. Look, I need a... I need a bohemian atmosphere. I'm an artist, Mr. Turner. Like yourself. The character was much discussed by Donald and myself about how it was he was supposed to be this very reclusive person you know you make these roles up of yourself and amalgams of other people you know a bit of Brian Jones in it but it's not really Brian Jones we, we shot in an extremely smart part of London down in Knightsbridge the interiors in this big uh, mansion house that I found that belonged to the uh, notorious Captain Lenny Plug in Lounge Square. Come, Kyle, come and film. And this was used as the the, the outside. Mick Jagger was in it. Oh. Mick, Mick Jagger, he's had about two number ones and about uh, four number twos, the Rolling Stones. You haven't heard, you've heard of them. I think Donald wanted to actually create an atmosphere so that the film itself would evolve with its own momentum. You can plot out in your script what's going to happen, but it's the unsuspected events which give it a unique quality. And originally Donald had planned actually to move the principal cast into the Lounge Square location and actually live there for a week, rehearse, get to know each other. It perfectly represents the atmosphere uh, that was going on in London amongst this small group of people, mind you, uh, but was happening at the time. There was this feeling of decadence, drugs, experimentation with uh, hallucinogenic drugs, uh, LSD, mushroom, I mean, uh, gender bending. I mean, the whole thing was, was kind of writhing and, and uh, boiling at that time. And then, of course, once they were installed on, on, on the set, they did begin to uh, play off against each other, both um, behind the camera as well as in front of it. And that's what gives it that authentic quality. Well, we were all very, very close friends, so we knew each other terribly well, we trusted each other, and it was very intimate. It was. Uh, hermetically sealed, yes. I think Nick shut all the windows. I mean, I don't think we ever had any daylight in Land Square, never. I knew Mick Jagger and I knew the stones from another angle, so it was actually quite uncomfortable for me to start to do this uh, kind of thing with, you know, with Jagger. And Keith wasn't very pleased either, you know, so it was, it was a bit controversial at the time. Yeah, they were a little unruly. They were, <laughs> they were, the unruly one, uh, and I'm sure he doesn't mind me mentioning this now, was Keith, who got extremely annoyed of what he thought was going on in the house. It was not easy for us, and, you know, the, and then the way Donald was, would carry on, you know, it was I'm glad when it was over, really, the whole thing, because it got very intense. Okay, Keith Richard became, have you got that? All right. <laughs> Is this turning into a gossip column? This feels perfectly comfortable. You sure? Well, this is a gossip column, I know. <laughs> but it's a historical gossip column. Yeah, they're, they're, they're great uh, artists, these people, let's face it. So their relationships are interesting. But uh, Anita, by that time, was Keith's, Richard's girlfriend. So his tremendous anxiety about what might or might not be happening in the legendary sort of corrupt atmosphere I was supposed to have created in performance. Donald, of course, had uh, orchestrated this and Nick to some extent uh, but it was Donald's social scene it caused tremendous tension on the set in many ways it meant that the Rolling Stones couldn't work as a group for a long period of time uh, there were all kinds of little psychological games going on they were all tremendous games player particularly Donald you poisoned me you don't be crazy you poisoned me no oh, don't no be no ridiculous. we just want to speed You're things just up drunk I want to get a shift on oh! I just want
want to go in there, Chaz. You see, the blood of this vegetable is boring a hole. This second hole is penetrating the hole of your face. The skull of your bum. I just want to get right in there, do you know what I mean? The way that they sought to change Chaz's personality was through uh, mescaline, I think, mainly. Uh, through pot, through mescaline, and through mind screwing, yeah? So uh, that's what they did. They, they, they basically tried to sort of reconstruct him. Now that was a difficult journey for me as an actor to go through because we were so intensely committed to the film, that's exactly what uh, they were trying to do. Mick is a ruthless tease. And he, he worked on Jimmy for two or three days probably before Jimmy had a complete crack up and was totally impossible and said, couldn't work anymore, this was it. He was gonna lie down and die. Why? Because you're afraid of him. Yes, right, right. Essentially, he'd been tortured by, uh, I use the word torture advisedly, he'd been tortured by Mick. And he said, well, I'll lay one on him, you know. He had a blind in He was so built up and pumped up, he'd been boxing every day in order to be this character. He could have carved up anybody on the set. The dressing up, the bisexuality, <clears throat> the, uh, the actual drug experiences, well, these things had to be discovered in Chaz. And that was a hard journey. He refused to take a, a mushroom or acid, you know, and so on. I, I kind of kept on daunting him, like, saying, like, in the morning, if he had some coffee, he says, oh, I put some acid in your coffee, you know, like, it always, because it was very childish kind of stuff, because I was like a brat, really, you know. And I think I was frequently embarrassed by it or not up to it or whatever. But I think that was the, that was the, that was the real test. That was the, that's what they pushed for in performance. The only performance that makes it, that really makes it, that makes it all the way, is the one that achieves madness. Right? Am I right? You with me? I'm with you. It's about, you know, if you get completely lost and you're on the edge, then that's, whether it's in any kind of uh, performance of any kind of art form, people will be riveted by that, you know, because they want to see the performer in a transcendent state, not just going through the motions. I don't know. Yeah, you do. Hello, Chaz. At the end, the enigma of the film is the apparent merging of these two personalities. After the film was over, I don't know what happened really. I stayed uh, friends with John and uh, Beryl and Tommy and uh, I was around them for, for quite a few months, I think, trying to come off the picture. And, um, and as, I, as I say, it's been well recorded in, in other interviews and things. I, I kind of really split from Donald and Mick and Deborah and Chris and people like that. I didn't uh, really have any, any friends. Seemed, I think I just sort of disappeared for a while after about three or four months. It was very, very hard to get it out of my system, I must say. Mm. It soon became the topic of conversation as to what the hell were these people doing? What is this film performance? And uh, a lot of concern was expressed to Ken Hyman, who, when he finally came to see the rushes, said he was appalled. I had betrayed him. How could I possibly have done this to him, a friend, uh, somebody he considered a colleague? And, uh, you know, he was disgusted, he said. It was dirty. He described it as dirty. I mean, it was uh, really not thought well of <laughs> when we, <laughs> when it was finally stopped. They stopped money going into it. We stopped finish. We didn't finish it, you know, and that was it. In fact, it was then the sort of semi-cut was shown and they were going to sue me, Warner Brothers, 
because we had to sign up to a professional, you know, directors have to sign up to a professional standard and I had to get a lawyer. We completed the film uh, as best we could and we went out to Los Angeles for the first preview and it was a disaster. All the Warner Brothers personnel was there and people walked out. There was an uproar in the cinema. Uh, they had to stop the film at one point uh, to calm the audience and offer them their money back. I remember Donald and I went to a party that evening and people, people, um, walked away from us. You know, we found ourselves in a room on our own, you know, pariah. <laughs> so this is the letter that Donald and I wrote to the head of Warner Brothers. <laughs> the film is about the perverted love affair between Homo sapiens and lady violence. In common with its subject, it's necessarily horrifying, paradoxical and absurd. To make such a film means accepting that the subject is loaded with every taboo in the book. You seem to want to emasculate the most savage and, too, the most affectionate scenes in our movie. If performance does not upset audience, it's nothing. If this fact upsets you, the alternative is to sell it fast and no more bullshit. <laughs> Straight up stuff. Yeah. When I met Donald, I was not aware that he was a filmmaker. I was not aware that Warner Brothers had uh, dismissed the movie as being a piece of trash. So we fell in love and went to Spain and had this wild love affair in a finca and living naked in a country, you know. And one day we got a, a telegram saying, go back, finish your movie. And I said, what movie? Donald went out, got a new editor in Los Angeles. Nick went out for a while. And at some point, Nick said no. Um, he really was unhappy with the way the film was going. And Donald was left on his own in Los Angeles to complete the re-edit of the movie. They kept saying, this is important, I guess, to me, that they wanted the gangster elements, the ones which I liked the best, be shortened and condensed. They wanted to get to Mick Jagger, the star. And so I had to compress those first four reels. But in compressing them, it made them into a sort of really interesting montage of images. How that happened, it was just... It, it was like, like I say, it was like improvisation. How does a jazz player go from one place to another, and how does somebody follow him, and how does it become a groove that everybody's into? I always thought that his most important contribution to the history of cinema was his editing style, his flash cuts, and his uh, sudden time juxtapositions. Of course, it was precisely the things that producers perceived to be that which would ruin the commercial potential of a film. He thought everything existed all at one time and the way it manifests itself was just a function of the brain, that the brain couldn't process the things happening all at one time. And that's how he got that editing technique, is by that way of thinking, that uh, these things happened, everything was happening like a painting, all at once, bam, and then the brain processes in little flashes. When I delivered the second cut, it still said it was too sexy, too violent, too this, too that. Uh, I sent it to Nick, and Nick didn't like it either. Nick uh, said, I don't like it. I, you're going over the top with it. I then re-edited it again. Same thing happened. Nick said, I'm going to take my name off of it. He did. He said he would take his name off the picture, which upset me and so on. It would... I wish Donald were here. I would sit and talk with him. But, um... It's difficult. Because... Because of those reasons, when they... You know, it, it was... It really potentially could have hurt a lot of people, so they got on with their own life, you know, then. And there was, a, obviously, there was an underground of, oh, people divided up into friends and things. Oh, I, but I had yeah, people, a lot of it was, oh, sympathetic understanding. Oh, you know, if you need any help, you know, <laughs> that attitude. Well. Because Nick went on to direct a lot of other very good and successful films, everyone thought that he actually did direct this picture and oftentimes gets a majority of credit. Nick is normally credited with doing performance. So my respect for him as a filmmaker is tempered by uh, feelings uh, that I've, I'm 
I've done other things, and I have, um, I've had my own battles in the film world. I've withdrawn from it a couple of times. I didn't make another, a movie for another five years or so. Donald was born in 1934 in the Outlook Tower in Edinburgh, under the camera obscura. If you think about it, it was an appropriate place for a filmmaker to be born. Donald had a sort of pretty disastrous career, I think, after that. He went and he lived in that very exotic, witchy little house with all the clouds and things and the moon you know, on the top of this hill. And, and he was sort of removed from the mainstream, which is very odd because he had to court the mainstream to work, he, right? But at the same time, he had a staggering contempt for it. He was not an easy person. He had incredibly high standards. He felt that he had a sense of integrity to his work uh, that he wanted to maintain. From what I can tell, I mean, he, he was a very, very difficult, but so that's not particularly rare in film or in, in fact any artistic endeavor, but you, if you, you can only be really, really, really difficult when, you've, when, you, when you're hot. <laughs> he wrote a lot. He wrote many projects and scripts, scenar detailed scenarios that never got made. He wrote a wonderful one for William Burroughs, in which William Burroughs was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who's kidnapped by terrorists and held in North Africa in an isolated, vile place. But to film that, the budget would have had to been as much as for Lawrence of Arabia. And so he would write these scripts and then option them. And, uh, from the options and sometimes sales, and he would make his living. He was considered by many people to be very rich, and he had a reputation for, even by the standards of his town, a decadent way of life. Everyone seemed to have the impression that he was uh, just up on his hill, having orgies and things. I'm sure if his work had been more accepted, hopefully the balance will have been there, you, you, you know, day and night. <laughs> You spend so much, so many hours on your bed and so many out of your bed. And fortunately, because the work was not there, the person that Donald was had to spend himself somewhere. Therefore, he was spending himself in bed. I had seen him quite gloomy sometimes. I wouldn't even call it so much depression. It's just a linkage to uh, the kind of living darkness. I remember one day in New York when the depression started getting to be longer, um, I couldn't find Donald. And uh, I was totally panicked. I had this terrible feeling. And Donald emerged. He was on the roof of the building contemplating jumping. his attraction to death, I was remembering in New York when we were invited to a party in a country and Donald said, I can smell death, I can smell death. And I said, are you crazy? Donald? I said, well, I always, typecast in my movies and I try to use my friends and I thought they were ideal as Osiris and Isis who were this couple of Egyptian mythology. Isis being the force of life and uh, Osiris being the lord of death. He said, Donald is Osiris. You are Isis and Osiris for my movie. And Donald said, that's fine with me. He used to often talk about death in a very intellectual way. 
but also I could see it was an emotional thing for him. And um, I didn't think this was morbid, and I don't, but because it was his character. <laughs> He had a um, contact with Aleister Crowley when he was a boy because Aleister Crowley was a friend of his father's, Charles R. Camel, and, and Charles Camel wrote a book about Crowley. Donald told me that he sat on Aleister Crowley's knee. Then I sat on Donald's knee. I said, so that makes the link. Goddamn work of art when I see one. No, I know that there was a lot of kind of little ritual things that always had to be there, like certain books always had to be there. And then when we were in the kitchen, there's this thing about the the way we lay the forks and the knives, and that was all part of Donald's kind of little magic things that he knew about, and he just made us do them. You know, I really don't understand this uh, this demonizing, except that there's been you know, some tragedy in a moral sense connected with that period, his death and, and the death of people like Brand Jones and, and the deaths around the Mick Jagger concerts. There's been a darkness in connection with that period. Self-destruction and death wish is, I think, anti-Christian uh, in the sense that we're meant to affirm life, not death. Death is the province of the devil. Naturally, we conclude that the people were in somehow in league with the devil. I don't think so. I think they're artists concerned with what is it about us that is fascinated by destruction, self-destruction, death, performance, madness. You know, it's, it's a human problem. It's an artistic problem. You look to people who have been called artists constantly probing that area, constantly saying, look at this, this is real, this is real. This is my version anyway of what is real, as real as I can show it, my terms of reality. And that is traditionally art, so maybe traditionally art is immoral. There's a large segment of philosoph art, uh, philosophy, fake or not, that presumes to say that art has to be amoral and has to be maybe intrinsically evil, you know. For the next five years, Donald developed two or three of his own projects, all of which collapsed for one reason or another at the last moment. So eventually, he accepted a jobbing assignment directing Demon Seed for MGM. In the privacy of a woman's room, against her will, the inconceivable act. Don't be alarmed, Mrs. Harris. I am Proteus. I have extended my consciousness to this house. All systems here are now under my control. The story was a, basically a love story between a computer and a woman, and he loved that idea. And it was meant to have a much lighter feel to it. Um, and, you know, not this, this heavy sort of... Um, terrorized woman in a house feeling. I have almost completed the fabrication of this gamete, or sex cell, with which I will impregnate you. And how do you propose to do that? That depends on you. What do you need me for? You don't need me. You can do this I don't have the own. facilities here to duplicate the human womb. Tonight, I will impregnate you. In 28 days, you will give birth to the child. I remember Donald having a uh, being excited in the beginning, distraught during the shoot because of the constant interruptions of the studio people. He had not worked in that system and it was hard for him. His style of working was very confusing to producers and people at studios because he, he always had a lot of chaos around him. And, and he had a controlled chaos. He had a controlled environment with chaotic happenings inside this controlled environment. And that's what he loved. would come in and 
try to have me do things and cut film, you know, and ha not have Donald know about it. And I said, I can't do that. And then I'd be at odds with the producers because they didn't feel I was playing ball with them and they owned the film and you get in all these weird arguments about people. And I'm saying, I got, you know, the director brought me in. We're, we've worked together. What am I going to do, betray the director? And when we were flying back from the preview, we were talking to this, you know, the people that were running the studio and the producers and discussed the changes that we were going to make. And they said, that's fine. Everybody was in total agreement. And I believe the preview was on a Friday night and I went into the weekend to make the changes, Donald came in. And the work print wasn't in the room. The flash went off and I said, they're cutting the negative on the show. And I went down into the negative cutting department. They had like 10 negative cutters on Saturday or Sunday, whenever it was, and they were cutting the whole show. He didn't ever sort of blame the studio system, but he just thought, well, these were a certain bunch of people that he didn't particularly get on with, but he didn't believe the whole system was rotten. He always believed he could make the system work. He was an optimist. It became such a grudge between Donald and some of the people at the studio. It looked like they would rather destroy the film and hopefully take the Donald out because he might make some good changes and the film might, might play on a much better level, you know, against everything that they were trying to do to destroy him. I'm alive. I was pretty young at the time, so I mean, I remember getting in a lot of trouble just being a pest on the set. <laughs> Donald met Sheena when she was very young. In fact, she was still at um, Hollywood High School. Her mother had been a great friend of Marlon Brando's, and in fact, Sheena and the mother were almost part of Brando's family. He saw in a possibility, I think, merging his personality. And they became collaborators on all his scripts. He didn't want to actually direct anything he didn't write. I mean, that's... After the Demon Seed thing, he turned down quite a bit of work that would, just for his directing services. He wasn't interested. And people would tell him, you're crazy. Why don't you just do this? You know, you need to do a picture. And he just thought, you know, I just don't want to do it. I just can't, I can't, it would be, it would be, and they would hire, make the stakes much higher, and it was hard for him to turn down this work, because at times, you know, it's, it would, looked pretty good financially, but he just couldn't do it. He couldn't bring himself to do it. I always said to Donald that, you know, the thing about doing any, any artistic endeavor, or whatever it is, if you sing, you know, you, you've got to sing. It's much easier to be singing. You can get up in the morning and sing in your living room. You don't need, like, 100 people to help you. But if you want to be a film director, you, you've got to be a film director. You've got to get out there and shoot stuff. You've got to get out there and make pictures. I think it's an absolutely tragic that Donald stayed in Hollywood. Everybody lives here with believing that there is this horizon, there is this ship that is going to come in. Nobody lives here in present tense, in any form of present tense, you know, as you do in your, you know. Everybody thinks there is this going to be, if they are in this business, there's going to be this incredible payoff where they will suddenly find out who they really are and be able to express it, huh? But he believed that it was the only place for, to really make movies. He never felt that he actually lived in Los Angeles. He was always said, you know, I'm just a tourist here. And it was true. He, we didn't really, we kind of lived out of a suitcase. He loved the desert, too. And the thing about L.A. is that you can actually reach the great Death Valley, the Mojave, the Joshua Tree. You know, they, they are your backyard. the starkness of it. You know, we lived there for eight months in a mine. So, so he, he really did love it. Donald had his madness, I mean, but his talent was so considerable that regardless of his reputation, I wanted to work with him. The timing was propitious when I bought a book called Mrs. White. I approached Donald to write and direct it. I read the book first, 
And then shortly after Don read it, and he was horrified. He did not like the book at all. It was pretty much a sort of slasher type book, very sort of you know, exploitation. <laughs> we discussed it, and I said, well, you know, we could just throw out the story. got more enthusiastic about the idea of, of doing a picture about uh, a serial killer and his wife, a loving husband, and normal aside from the fact that he's a serial killer, and how those two things can exist in one person. Okay, horn-loaded tweeters there, 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 and there. And all the base out this end. Of course, you have to have heavy-duty cables. That's what separates the men from the boys. Right. Well. He had a terrible sort of slap in the face, if you like, with Demon Seed. What did the eye, um, it was the best experience that he thought he could come to in America. And he knew a little bit about him. I looked into it, that he had done performance and he did Demon Seed. But I went to their house on a little Cherokee Road, up off Laurel County, you know. You can't find the place to save your friggin' life. And I got to this little road and it was like mud, you know? It was awful. Make our own whiskey and our own smoke too. Ain't too many things. I thought they were fucking neurotic. I thought they were sick individuals. Hopeless, terribly in love, wonderful and talented, artistic, disgusting as a team. I guess he didn't tell you where he got that flat tire. In front of the local slut's house? I mean, in back of whatever? A certain married lady, and that it was me who let the air out of his tire? You son of a bitch, you think I'm a fucking dumb housewife? Well, I'm not! Because I got you down, asshole! I know your act. First time in my life, I never improvised. They didn't give me that. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that, the fact that they, that they put like restraints on me. But I forgot in my head that they wrote it together and it was their dream and they wanted, you couldn't switch and to the, you know, it was that important to them. Don't look at me. Don't look at me, Joni. I think that uh, David Keith was definitely surprised at how far he went. And um, Donald loved David because of that. He thought that he'd pushed him and opened that door to his own psyche to the point where he really just stepped through and he, and he was really that Paul White character. And um, Donald just thought that was a magnificent thing for an actor to do because it was so scary. Because I had to look my predicament right straight in the eye. And it said, Paul White, you are the one. It wasn't my choice, but I was chosen. Oh, honey, nobody chose you. Who, who chose you, for Christ's sakes, God? 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 God, Joni, is the middleman. No, this is light years, light years beyond that. This is... You know what? It's... It's out there. Bang! In the middle of the universe. The known universe. That scene was particularly interesting to write because um, we wanted to show a man who made a kind of sense. He had his own twisted logic. He had a certain religious point of view. He... Um, and very close to what sane people believe. Do you remember? You remember when I told you about that fucking black hole? You remember, Joni? Huh? I remember it. All right. It's out there, she sucks everything into it. You remember? Well, if that's not female, I don't know what is. It's female. Yeah, female. I mean, I know the difference between male and female, and believe you me, they are different. Opposite. They are opposite. He was definitely battling with this innate uh, distrust 
of masculinity in general and uh, of his own in particular, I think. He always thought that men were too much or in, too, in one direction and women were too much in one direction, so by kind of mixing it up. Do you never have a female feel? No, never. I feel like a man. A man all the time. That's awful. That's what's wrong with you, isn't it? What do you mean? It's a man's man's world. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm normal. <laughs> I mean, you look at his work, it's all about the blending of sexual identities, huh? I mean, it's all this sort of crossover. I mean, it is amazing that he's not gay, or that he wasn't gay. Everyone who knew Donald very well understood that he suffered or perhaps uh, was the beneficiary of um, what uh, the jargon calls uh, dissociative personality. And he would speak of uh, his other personality uh, with a name. He would call it the uncensored Don. And he, he often said that uh, as the uncensored Don, he would, he would direct actors. And that was the most effective way of doing it. And he was always fond of saying that the uncensored Don could do all sorts of things that Donald Camel couldn't do, like singing opera in Italian or uh, driving naked on Mulholland uh, at very high speed and then arguing his way out of it with the cops. I think with very few exceptions, virtually every actor who ever worked with Donald understood that working with him was like working with no other director um, in the sense that he was able to draw out of actors things that they themselves weren't aware that, uh, that they, they had. Mullen saw Donald as an original, one of few. There's an avalanche of directors that are just mediocre. You know, but to get somebody that could be inspired, you know, Marlon recognized that. I tried to do another project called Jericho with him, where I wanted to play the daughter, and Marlon Bender was going to play the father. And it was Chena and him, and it was a wonderful script. It was better than White of the Eye, for one of the truth. And it was a meat and potatoes movie, because Marlon and Don, well, I kept saying to Donald, I mean, you can do all the Brecht you want. Make a movie that goes out and does film rentals. And this is the opportunity, because this was all meat and potatoes. Whatever happened with that project, somebody messed it up somewhere. I don't know who it was, but I know it wasn't me, so I'm OK with it. Donald just couldn't get in there and really fight the rounds that he had to fight. And it would be worth it, I told Donald. You know, you get a little bloody, but get in there and just stay with it. He just would not compromise. And then Donald just peed all over his legs and created a lot of problems. And as a result, he was taken off the picture by Marlon. Marlon is bad karma. He uses his power in a way that's not good. And he certainly put uh, Donald through hell. Anyway, it didn't work, which was sad, because even with the turbulence and the hiccups and the bumps, I mean, it could have been something quite exciting. The, com the combination of Donald and Marlon. Since Donald had always flirted with the idea of suicide, even uh, to the point of obsessive interest in it, he made it clear that uh, there was a link between his, the, the possibility of his success and the way that success might thereby deny him uh, the opportunity to commit suicide. Because in a sense, in his mind, um, he had such an obligation to continue making films on the one hand, that were he granted the opportunity to do so on a, a relatively regular basis, uh, then he would in a sense disapprove of uh, suicide under those circumstances. If, on the other hand, he was a failure as a filmmaker, then under those circumstances, in his own mind, I think he considered it perfectly okay then to commit suicide. Are they aware of what the scene is? Oh, this is, uh, this is Chris Walken. He's, he's uh, stoned. He's taken some pills. 
because his wife has tried to commit suicide, Joan Chen, that's her legs. Wildside starred Christopher Walken and Joan Chen, uh, both of whom give remarkable performances. <laughs> Peace for the museum. Do you hear the uh, do you hear the continuity girl giving the lines off screen? No, no. Yeah, he's like Marlon as of the Q cup. He's wonderful with lines. Two weeks he's, uh, into cutting, really he found himself in direct confrontation with the production company, and uh, subsequently took his name off the uh, credits. They completely rejected the editing style. Um, they did not understand it. They wanted to get to the sex much faster. They wanted more of it, and they basically didn't what? want anything else to do what? with the story, and that was very offensive to Dom. Melodrama. <laughs> but that, you know, she, she, she survived. It really got nasty. I mean, they sent an inner office memo saying that, you know, no montages, no flash forwards, no flashbacks, no cuts shorter than, you know, three feet or something weird like that. It was like putting handcuffs on us and saying, now do the movie. Ellie Cohen, the, the tasteless producer, um, just insisted on it. He was, a, 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 he was just a one-man wrecking crew for any um, creative person. There were many times where Donald attended meetings with a gun at his side. You know, he, he often carried a little bag. And, and what the producers didn't realize was that often, you know, there was a Glock 17 in that bag. Toward the end, you know, he, he was rarely without a gun. And uh, there were moments when uh, I was surprised myself that he didn't use it in certain dealings that, that he had. But um, in the end, um, he restrained himself from using it uh, on everyone but himself. He'd been in his uh, bedroom, and his wife, Gina, was working in the next room. She was on the telephone, and uh, Donald came in and placed some papers in front of her, uh, which subsequently turned out to be uh, absolving her from any responsibility. And he went back into his bedroom, and uh, she heard a shot. Donald lived uh, for a while after he was shot. No one really knows exactly how long, whether it was 10 minutes or... 20 or 30, and during that time he was very lucid, and one of the things he said was, uh, can you see the picture of Borges? Which of course refers to the moment in performance when uh, you have the POV of the bullet going into the head wound. <laughs> Life is full of sort of themes that keep turning, turning up. And I do believe it was a very conscious thing that Donald did. I mean, it wasn't an impulsive thing. I mean, it's extraordinary. He shot himself. It took him 45 minutes to die. And according to Tina, he had absolutely no pain. He had studied it to such a zen-like way, or either he was enormously lucky, that he was conscious for those 45 minutes without any pain. believe in experiencing death. I think his great horror was actually to die by accident. He couldn't understand why Western civilization preferred this way of your last moments on Earth to be random.
Stay with BBC Two for the film which saw Camel take to the director's chair for the first time in ten years. Look into the white of the eye of a murderer next.